namo myo ho renge kyo namo myo ho renge kyo namo myo ho renge kyo hi friends i hope this finds you well in good spirits good health good circumstance chi some of you will i didn't just sneeze <laughs> chi is what we're going to talk about today uh, it's often spelled Q-I, Qi. Uh, sometimes an older spelling uh, depends on the convention, the translator, there we go with language again, sometimes translated as C-H-I, Qi. You might be tempted to say Chai, but it's pronounced Qi. I was introduced to the concept of Qi before I can remember. I was very, very young. Uh, my father was a judoka. Uh, we grew up in Montreal, and Montreal, as you may or may not know, is uh, where judo first left Japan and was introduced to the West via Montreal. And the old master, who used to be a practitioner of jiu-jitsu, which is a very uh, brutal martial art, he... Um, because of World War II, Japan was prohibited from practicing its uh, most violent martial arts. And uh, he invented a system of practicing many of the same, uh, if not these same, uh, fundamentals of jiu-jitsu and removed the killer parts, Right. Um, and invented a scoring system by which he could make this traditional martial art into a sport so that Japan wouldn't lose all of its heritage, right? And, uh, well, it took off. The, the people of Japan obviously needed to keep their traditions. They were very much into that, still are today. And uh, when they branched out, they first went to Montreal, and uh, the exemplar student, because the master was very old, that uh, the master brought along as uh, an exemplar, somebody to instruct and show the moves and uh, the methods. Well, he had been formally trained as a jiu-jitsu. So um, he got, he and the master parted ways in Montréal. And uh, evidently, this jiu-jitsu practitioner was, uh, well, the way they were promoting judo was they were taking on all comers. So yeah, it wasn't as pristine as I may have made it sound. I didn't try to do that. Basically, this guy was an exemplar of many martial arts. And uh, to promote judo, uh, they basically took on boxers, wrestlers, judoka, anything anyone was practicing, come on up, see if you could beat my star student, and uh, he would promote judo in this way, and it caught on quite, quite a lot. But as I say, they parted ways, and you may have heard of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Well, when this judoka, jiu-jitsu practitioner left the master, he went all the way down the coast looking for a place to and he ended up in Brazil, where he met up with the Gracies. And uh, there, the, the story is folklore, yeah? So, uh, same roots. Um, one, a sport-focused uh, style of the martial art, whereas uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, although it is seen in MMA and so forth, has to... Uh, abide by different rules in order to be accepted in MMA. But uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, less sports-oriented and more, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat-oriented. So, anyway, bottom line is, um, I was introduced through my relatives. My dad was one of 22 children, lots of relatives, not all in Judo, but anyway. So I was introduced early on to the idea of energy, energy in the universe, energy in that universe being channeled through each of us individually. And while we can store, build, or lose chi, 
uh, we can manipulate it for our health, uh, for our strength, for our defense, so on and so forth. So chi is a, it's kind of a hand in glove kind of fit for the way we understand energy in Buddhism. Now, energy, Buddhism isn't itself a practice of uh, manipulating energy. Certainly not. However, it comes up a lot because there's a, a physics, a science, a cosmology, a biology, an electromagnetism at the fundament of the truth of all phenomena. Now, in Buddhism, we're concerned with living this life fully. That's what Buddhism is about. But in the pursuit of living life fully, we kind of have to understand what is living life and how does living it fully impact living that life? Isn't that what we're doing? Well, Shakyamuni identified, Buddhism identifies that although, yes, we're living life, we're largely responding to life. We're waiting for stuff to happen and we're reacting to it. And to the degree we have certain karmic what do we call it? We, we call it fortune. We, we seem to divide everything into a good or a bad. That's a human samsaric identifying thing, yeah? But things either bring you joy and fulfillment or they take away from joy and fulfillment. And again, we largely respond to those cues. We're, we have very little, seemingly very little influence on manifesting joy simply out of the process of life itself. Yeah, we do things like buy ourselves gifts, buy others gifts, or we chase after money and so forth, but those are very fleeting feelings and the cost of accruing those adds more stress and suffering and anxiety and so forth. So Buddhism says quite simply, uh, you've been looking at the problem all wrong. Life isn't happening to you. You don't have to chase after this stuff and, and, uh, or, or, or respond to it, see if you're quicker to respond than the other person. You know, No, you can take the wheel. You can actually drive this life of yours. That is fulfilling your life's potential because you're instantiating it instead of waiting for it to happen and responding. And by the way, while you're influencing it, you can minimize those things that impinge or take away from your joy, your, your security, your happiness. Hmm? And you don't have to stress about all the stuff because that's where your suffering is coming from. Wait, what, what? Yeah, so although a big part of Buddhism is understanding that everything has the same source, that energy manifests in myriad potentials endlessly, constantly, moment to moment, moment. That's all well and good. But in Buddhism, the whole point is that we use that knowledge to free ourselves from the boundary of thingifying and identifying simply to experience the process itself. Right now, right now, right now. Look at this. Look at you and I. Look at this video. Look at what we're doing right now. This is amazing. It's always amazing. It's always brand new. It's renewing itself every single moment. How long is a moment? Well, we dig into that, right? Everything we ask in Buddhism, our curious samsaric mind wants to know to the nth degree. Well, Buddhism goes there. Not because... That's necessary, but because we make it necessary. At some point, you stop doing that. At some point, you realize you have confidence, you have resolve that when you invoke your Buddha mind, you're in it. You're living life to the full. Maintaining that mental experience is the fulfilling life. 
There are no obstacles. Hmm? But in a very real way, the reason that that's working is because the energy, the chi, is flowing unobstructed, unhinged upon, unattacked, unattached. It's free flowing. So, yeah, chi is not a Buddhist term, but I use it. I use it when we talk. I use it in my other teachings, and certainly in Buddhism. It's in my writings. It's even in the meditations, right? Wuji and Taiji, but Taiji is the work of energy, Qi, right? So we're going to talk about it a little bit today. It's an interesting subject. Expand, maybe give you a different perspective on what's this energy into formations, into form karma. What's another way to talk about karma? but the flow of energy, momentum. Merriam-Webster has a variant spelling, as I already said, C-H-I-Chi. Two, it's considered, and this is from ancient Chinese medicine. It even goes back to India as well. Vital energy that is held to animate the body internally and is of central importance in some Eastern systems of medical treatments such as acupuncture and of exercise or self-defense such as Tai Chi or Tai Chi Chuan. Hmm? A bioelectric force cultivated and manipulated within one's body, renewed from one's environment and discarded once exhausted back into the earth. This is the basis for ancient practices of developing methods for maximizing health, cleansing of channels and organs of the human body through cultivation and manipulations of the collection and flows of qi in the body. Qigong, a word you may have heard, or qi, yeah, an alternate spelling, is an exercise program for this purpose. Now, you may be interested, just as a little anecdote, and then we'll get into it. Most of you, I'm sure, have heard something about the Shaolin temple, or the Shaolin monks, or Bodhidharma. The story goes something like this, and I'm going to add brevity, as I'm fond of saying. <laughs> I laugh at myself. So this Indian monk was called upon to come to China and, uh, you know, pretty much revitalize, rescue uh, the Shaolin monks at their head temple, their, uh, their, what you would call today, their sponsor, their government funding. They sent for this guy because... These monks, you know, they were just keeping to themselves in their, their little monastery and uh, doing their meditating and trying to cultivate some sort of peace for themselves and the countryside and the kingdom they were sponsored f by. And marauders would come through and occasionally, as they were wont to do all over China, and they'd come in and beat up the monks and take their take all their stores of rice. Yeah, people starving will do things, right? And the monks, you know, being cloistered and doing their meditations all day, they weren't getting much exercise, they weren't doing much, and they were weak. They couldn't defend their own food stores. Well, that needed to change. Or we weren't going to support the Shaolin Temple anymore. We'll just go on to some other brand of Taoism, and uh, that was pretty much the order of the day back then. And so Bodhidharma comes along, and he surveys the situation, and he uh, says, man, these guys aren't even healthy enough to meditate properly. 
got to I've got to increase their health, got to help their health. Now, there's varying stories about this. Some say that he went up into the hills and hid in the cave for 10 years to develop his system of uh I'm trying to remember the the, the title is long. It's the um the tendon and sinew regeneration and strengthening exercises. It's not exercises, it's called it something else, but program, whatever it was. And he started to teach the monks, whether it took 10 years or 10 months, we'll leave that for a different discussion, but he introduced this system of movements of the body, displacing weight, using the body, because they didn't have weight systems and weight rooms back then, using the body and whatever was around to develop the tone and the health of the body. This was done in full consciousness of breathing in energy from one's environment, right? We oxygenate our blood. That gives us strength and energy. The blood, the oxygenated blood goes to the different organs, right? There's a lot of science behind this, although this predates that kind of science. But we manifest in the process of bringing that blood to health, a bioelectric force throughout the body. Everything is electromagnetic in the universe. Everything. Right? So, cultivating this into what's called the dantian, the, the gut, building chi, can make you sick. So you also have to learn how to pass it through the body so that it does its work of revitalization. And then, with whatever corrosives, poisons, or ills that it may encounter sweep them along with it and poof, right you see massage artists do this kind of thing or mentally move it through down into your feet and into the ground some way of expressing this chi as it's cleansed the body and offered its nourishment as well as expiating getting rid of excrementing the negative energies, the negative, you know what I mean, right? Detrimental energies. So this is old, old medicine. And of course, over time, these exercises develop in the Shaolin Temple to not only strengthen the monks, make their meditation much more effective, but they develop from this movements of self-defense not attack not it's not a martial art it's not a but it is martial in that you marshal your strength and you know how to use it now tai chi chuan the chuan part of tai chi the the, the cultivating and the manipulation the putting to work right formations you see the corollaries here? Putting to work this bioelectric force to then manifest it, literally Chuan make a fist, is to not take all that energy and make a fist, but make a fist so that you create a, a point of delivery to express with great conviction that force that chi, and with that force, can create a blow that will stop a person dead in their tracks, right? Not just stop, but move back. Time's up, right? And the idea is to stop conflict as quickly as possible. Not to fight, to end the fight, right? This starts the whole martial arts, wushu, development in China. Now, there may be other sources, but this is the one lineage that I'm familiar with studying the martial arts. I think it's an interesting antidote because Bodhidharma was a Buddhist monk. 
And he was called to China to help rescue these weak Shaolin Taoist monks and basically took ancient medicines from India, China, developed a system of strengthening that the Chinese would then take on to their own, the Shaolin Temple certainly, hmm? and taught them influxed Buddhism into Taoism, and the two kind of melded. In an, they're not that far apart. They kind of complete each other in a way. Buddhism is a standalone philosophy, don't get me wrong. But Taoism is kind of leaning that way without being so intricate. That was a much more holistic, right? Buddhism is as well, but it's not, that's not its focus. Its focus is your mind. And Taoists would say, well, so is Taoism. Yes, but from a much different perspective. A oneness with the totality. Whereas Buddhahood is, a, is an expression of the complete self as the totality, there's, there's a difference, not part of, but of yeah, semantics, yes? But Buddhism, a very different practice, very focused on what's going on in our mind rather than the body as an organism of the universe. But you see how closely they intertwine? So, in Buddhism and in Chinese martial arts, qi or qi is also called the bioelectric energy transmitted through the body. As such, qi is an integral part of Chinese medicine concerning the energy flows of the body, as well as the Taoist extension of this energy flowing throughout our self and environment. The concepts of many ancient arts from China, India, Japan, all over Asia have some version of energy work for health as well as martial implementation, right? Even the Japanese martial, I brought up judo, they talk about ki. Well, same thing, right? It's just different pronunciation, different word, same idea. So the story I gave you about Bodhidharma, semi-legendary Buddhist monk, lived in the 5th or 6th century CE. Uh, his original exercises developed to strengthen the monks at the temple for improvement in their health, blah, blah, blah. I told you about that, Shaolin Kung Fu. He's known as Damo in China and as Daruma in Japan. Um, Bodhidharma is who we're talking about. Uh, little contemporary biographical information on Bodhidharma is extant, and subsequent accounts became layered with legend and unreliable details, but that's the way folklore is, right? Uh, he is credited by most branches of Chan, with later in Japan, Zen, as the forefather of Chan or Zen, well, he was sent there to help the monks strengthen their bodies so that they could focus their minds in meditation. So you can see how that leads to that later branch, not really Buddhism, but something akin to, yes? For our practice of Buddhism, it is relevant to understand our in intimate relationship of mind and body, and thirdly, with our environment. You see, the idea of qi, or qi, however you spell it, is that this flow of energy can be concentrated and expressed throughout and within the body with purposeful intent, but also that it is the body acting as a conduit from and returning into the environment surrounding us. Once again, the unity of our self as environment. And there it is. That's the whole point of the the discussion of chi, it marries very nicely with our idea of energy formations into form karma, right? Karma being a freight train of tendencies and conditions, electromagnetic forces that constitutes our being. It's very similar to chi, but more individuated, more specificity. Same idea, though, right? Okay. That's it for chi. Next up, oh, a nice easy one, a short one. <laughs> yes, I'm making fun. Quantum fluctuations. <sighs> Stay tuned for that one. 
Thanks for joining in. Thanks for taking a moment to like and subscribe. It's very important to uh, grow the Sangha. Make use of the free resources at threefoldlotus.com and uh, the Buddhahood podcast, right? If you're looking uh, for reference books, you can get ebooks right now very easily through threefoldlotus.com on the ebooks page or at lulu.com slash spotlight slash kuhn. There's links in the uh, description and on threefoldlotus.com. All the links are there. I still haven't sent out uh, that email with those. I just refreshed that today. So I'm going to get that out to you patrons, uh, a copy of this book, the electronic version. And I've been debating whether, oh, excuse me, I've been debating whether I send out the ebook. I noticed that the ebook actually requires, of course, you can get the software for free on if you're on a Windows machine or an app. Uh, you can go to the store and get an ebook reader. Um, it's a form of a PDF, but if you have a regular PDF reader, it, it probably it may not read the ebook file. So I was thinking, well, maybe I should send both the PDF and the ebook file. The ebook file is really lovely the way it displays on any device. Uh, it's really easy to use. I kind of want to send that one out because it's so much easier to use and on any device. PDF is it, it struggles to uh, to fit different size devices to to see the print that kind of thing. So maybe I'll send both. Uh, maybe oh I'll just add the instruction to go to your your app store and get a free app to to read these. That's what I'll do. All right. Sorry to think out loud. <laughs> uh, I just feel like we're together at home and discussing Buddhism. Thank you for that. Thank you for your practice. Take care of your health. Be kind. And I'll see you in the next one. Okay? Bye for now. Bye.